From Groove U Studios in Columbus, Ohio, this is Getting the Brand Back Together, a podcast exploring the interdisciplinary art of banding, branding, and business. Rock and roll relic, poet, writer, and brandist. I'm your host, Brad Sircone. Today, we are joined by Dwight Heckelman, who's the director of Groove U, who hosts this podcast. Thank you very much for being on the show. Well, thank you for having me, Brad. Absolutely. And so we were talking even before the show about Dwight's background and my background in the music business. And yes, of course, we have concluded that it is a tiny little world, right? And you, you, uh, you said yesterday you were having um, some conversations with some people that you had on the Zoom call to come in from Nashville, right? And what was the phrase? The the phrase was the music industry is high school with money. (laughs) <laughs> and I just love that because it's true. It's very true. And I think you and I said we're going to add a patio yeah. and a maybe an inflatable maybe a mini bar or and an inflatable swan. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'd like to first talk about how this brainchild of yours came to be. Sure. And I know that you're originally from Ohio and then you spent about a decade in Nashville right. and of course, I want to talk about, uh, as a career specialist, I think you were at Berkeley. I was. Right? Mm-hmm. So, I, I want to talk about what how this journey began. Right. Uh, and, and where the concept came from. Because in my experience, as we were talking in the music business, I don't know of a more robust curriculum mm-hmm. for the music business than what you have going on at Groove U in the United States. Well, that's our hope, at least. And yeah. That's what we aspire to, is, is that it's... Uh, we're gonna. Our students are gonna be the most capable uh, when they come out of here, out of any of their peers at other institutions. Right, right, and and that's awesome. And we were talking about some of the curriculum, which we're gonna get into in the podcast. I think it's fascinating how thoughtful you have been in the curriculum. I want to know, you know, is that stuff you're innovatively picking up elsewhere, or that sure. you, again also your brainchild over time? But sure. we'll get into that. But why don't you bring us back to the early days <laughs> and what you were thinking about. How early about. do we have to go here? <laughs> well, we I have an hour. give away my age. <laughs> well, I've already done that. <laughs> but if you could at least talk about uh, when this idea first popped into your head. Sure. And, and why, why you felt there was a need mm. for this. Now, I know that I, I was reading some articles. You know, you said that uh, only in the media arts, mm-hmm. only 40% of those uh, have a, a have a, something besides have, a two year vocational d- has word, something right? other than right a two year vocational degree. So mm-hmm. obviously you saw an opportunity there, but how how did it develop? How did you start all of this? So it, it it's probably been one of those things that's been developing for a lot longer than I want to think about. When I <laughs> when I went when I was in high school and I went to my band instructor and I asked him, hey, I think I want a career in music. Mm-hmm. You know, he told me what. I say is very sort of backwards looking ideas. He said, well, you could get really good on your instrument and you can be in an orchestra or you can get really good on your theory and you can write for an orchestra or you can teach music. I didn't want to do any of that. (laughs) (laughs) I think they're fine careers, you know, but like that wasn't how I consumed music. And, you know, he knew that I was in garage bands. I mean, we're talking, but, uh, you know, I had a a synth and a four track recorder and, you know, I was, I was making, you were mobile. I was, yeah, I was making, yeah. Yeah. With my, you know, 900 pound Kawhi K3. I was super mobile. (laughs) (laughs) But like this, yeah, it is not like that. It, It wasn't really, he was looking at what he considered the traditional classical careers in music. And I, I didn't want that. I didn't know what I wanted, but I knew it wasn't that. So, you know, I did what any sensible young man would do when I joined the Navy. <laughs> <laughs> well, those options aren't any good. Yeah. What about the uh, Navy? Uh, yeah. So four years later, like, okay, well, that's not necessarily a good option. But, uh, you know, it did help a lot with discipline and yeah. understanding. I'm not going to lie. But I did sort of start down that path a little bit. I went into Bowling Green State University for music composition. Uh, hmm. And it took about a year and a half for that to suck all the love of music out of me. Yes. Uh, so I ended up transferring to Belmont, which is a, a I saw that yeah a program in yeah, Nashville. I saw that you did. Uh, that. I got my degree in the music business, and uh, I was kind of off and running, or so I thought. Now back then, if I may, mm-hmm. at Belmont, what did they call that degree? So it was it is a it's a bachelor's of business. Okay. Uh, so it, it has it has a big business core. You know, yeah. two economics, two accountings. Good. Strategic management, which I'm still not sure what that, 
I know I wrote a paper about what I was going to do if I was uh, managing Boeing. Like, okay. Not uh, Bowie. Oh, you said the good, Boeing. The good one Not is, Bowie. Uh, my, my individual paper had to be on Kodak. And I recommended that they move more into digital. And my teacher gave me a C. <laughs> Really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so Who would do that? Yeah, exactly. Oh, they're chorus film. Why are you telling them to go? Digital? Right. I wasn't too long out of Belmont when I kind of had my first epiphany about education. Uh, I was actually working for recording studios and I was writing for Music Row magazine, which is a trade publication. Yep, in I'm Nashville. very familiar with it. And this is 19... 19- uh, 99. Okay. okay. And it is the spring of 1999. And uh, Music Row puts on a little conference and it's called Music in New Technologies Conference. And we love acronyms in the music business. So it was the Mint Conference, yeah. right? And uh, we had Hillary Rosen, who's president of the RIAA. We had uh, Joe Galente, who was then president of RCA Records. They were talking about, we were talking about this, this stuff called Napster. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, because Napster came online in July of 98. No, yeah. I was going to say but, 98 or 99. But it's, uh, we're about, you know, f- no, it's not big. It's just starting to get big. Right. And I'm listening to, you know, these experts in the business uh, talk about what we're going to do and how we're going to get the genie back in the bottle. Right. Right. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty young, uh, but like my first reaction was, uh, was a uh, fear. <laughs> like, what have I gotten myself into? There's, right. no, there's no future. Yeah, that was exactly, I'm like, I am really well prepared for an industry that doesn't exist. <laughs> exactly. That, or that will not exist in this yeah, form. Yeah, the future of years. Kodak, apparently. Yeah, right. <laughs> Should have stuck with Boeing. <laughs> uh, so I'm like, wow, like this is going to change everything. And I don't think they realize that, right. you know, and, but I'm young and I'm like, the, my, my peers are going to be like all over this. And then my second reaction was actually anger. Because, you know, I just spent a lot of money at college. Not once had a single professor mentioned file trading, peer-to-peer, pe- peer-to-peer technology, right. uh, compression, right? Yeah. Compression was never mentioned right. in terms of file compression. Right, right. And so, you know, here I'm going to date myself. I walked the three city blocks to the Nashville Public Library. Mm-hmm. I went to the card catalog. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I flipped back till I found a book entitled MP3 Power and You. Yeah. That was dated 1994. Okay. Okay. This is 1999. Very so, smart, by the way. So, uh, yeah, uh, I was just like, you were in a wow. panic. I was kind of in a panic. <laughs> does, does panic make you smarter? Maybe. <laughs> Maybe it does with me on the road. <laughs> uh, and, you know, here, you know, I'm learning that, you know, our industry in conjunction with film developed motion picture engineering group, which is what MP3 stands for, layer three technology as a way for us Duh, to share great. files from, you know, composers of film in New York with LA. Hollywood. So I'm like, our industry invented this. How did my instructors never mention this? Mm -hmm. You know, I did fine. I went on, you know, Don't Cry For Me, Argentina. I worked for record labels and music publishers. I ended up starting a a music program uh, down at Hawking Technical College in 05 before I did get asked to uh, be a part of Berkeley. Um, And for me, you know, uh, that was a little bit like a doctor saying, "Hey, do you want to no, come? To, you want to come to Harvard and, yeah, yeah. and teach here? Yeah, yeah, it's the apex. Right? It's the apex. Yeah, it's 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 the hypothetical end goal. Yeah. And so I went to Berkeley. I uh, worked in career development. Berkeley was hosting a conference. <laughs> we love conferences in the yeah. music business. <laughs> it's love so them. true. We love them. It's like we can't do anything alone. <laughs> I know. Can other people get in the room and is think. There, with is there us? another conference next month I can go to? Anybody know about one? Right. Okay. So, um, and Berkeley was hosting a conference of music and entertainment industry educators. It's called, it's called MIA. It stands for Music Entertainment Industry Educator Course Association Conference. And Berkeley was hosting it that year. So every college in the country that has a music industry program, for the most part, was has, there. has educators that went to this. Yeah. And I was super excited because I'm like, oh yeah, like this is, this is, this is it. Right. And I went from like, from room to room, like yeah. listening to other educators talk about educating for the music industry. And the dialogue was wrong. I heard people say, you know, well, the music industry is uh, changing. And I'm like, changing? Changed It changed. Uh, right. I was in the room. Right. <laughs> when it changed, that was 10 years ago now, right? Yeah. Like, why are we still talking like we don't understand what this is? And it, shouldn't it be our job as educators to train for the jobs that are coming? And not the jobs that existed. So students don't fumble around for Yeah, the future. Yeah, for 10 years or 20 years wondering why they don't have the skills they need. And, you know, I left there, that conference, like super disheartened. I went back to my desk, sat down, and uh, I penned my resignation letter to Berkeley. Okay. And I said, um, you know, I'm really sorry, but uh, 
I think I can do better. Mm-hmm. Good um, for you. So that that's really the, <laughs> that was the impetus. That was the spark. Okay. You know, but like I said, it'd been brewing for a long time. Yeah, Always yeah. watching these people kind of look backwards. We're not an industry uh, that can afford to do that ever. So for me, it was like, why why are students not? Nobody should have to go through what I went through. Right? No, no. And, and, and to your <laughs> point, the industry is about, if it's about anything, it, the phrase that we always use in the agency business is creative innovation. Mm-hmm. Let us innovate forward. Don't positive, hold, positive disruption, right? Exactly. Yep. Don't, don't hold us back. Yep. Let us go. Yep. Exactly. And that's your point. Yeah. That was my, that then, so, you know, without really knowing how to do it, I just said, I, I'm not sure if I'll be successful, but. Uh, I, there's got to be a better way. Right, right. And if nothing else, maybe we can have some positive disruption. Yeah, and yeah. Get people to sort of pay attention to what yeah. should be happening. And the journey can be fun. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it cannot be fun, but it can also yeah. be fun. <laughs> yeah. At times. At times. Okay, so your first, the first edifice that you were using to do this in mm-hmm. was in on uh, West Fifth Avenue. It was. Is that yep. right? In yep. Grandview. Yep, it was the old uh, Fifth Avenue Elementary School. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, so when I came back to Ohio uh, to do this, you know, uh, first thing I did was I put together an advisory board of all the people I knew in the business. And it's still the same questions we ask them today. I asked them two questions. Who are you hiring and why? Mm. Not now, but two years from now. Yep. Give me that answer. Like, tell me who you would hire two years from now. Because if I'm at least two years ahead of the curve, then by the time my students get out, they'll they'll be in good shape. That's beautiful. And, you know, we use that to sort of uh, build the initial sort of foundational ideas for the program. And uh, then I started looking for a space. And I said, you know, it would be great, like an old elementary school, because like, what else is it going to be used for? Right. And yeah, so we worked it out with CCS and I renovated that building. It was about a $1.2 million renovation. I was going to ask you, so you did, you had to pump a lot of... Oh yeah, it was a gut and yeah. we renovated it. Um, now, how'd you get funding for that? Uh, angel investors yeah. and, you know, uh, some some BC and yeah. my own money and, yeah. you know. Um, so yeah, so we raised uh, all our investment through through private investment. Uh, we We built that space out. We were there for yeah uh, five years. Okay, and we wanted this space actually initially, but I, Alan still Alan was still here here, and he wasn't. He was kind of. Ah, I think I want to get rid of it, but I he wasn't. Think I he don't. wasn't certain, and, right? And, and you had and a business the, decision, and, to and make. at the time, I was like, man, I, I just got to get rolling. You yeah. know, the longer I wait, the less likely this would be to happen. Yeah. So yeah. you can't dreamline forever. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in five years, then I guess this opportunity. By the way, that we're sitting in the Grooveview Studios. Mm-hmm. And they are beautiful. Every guest that's come in here from Dr. Roger Blackwell to Jamie Richardson at White Castle mm-hmm. all write me back and say, that studio is fabulous. Thank, Thank you. You. <laughs> you know, for um, just the experience, the environment right. here is great. Thank it you. really is. Um, but how did you, what after five years? Because I know you wouldn't so, have made that investment to so, move in five right. years. So, to, uh, so. You know, CCS, the short north is growing up. CCS CCS was putting some pressure on us. We had a 10-year lease, but they're okay. like, if you guys want to get out early, we are totally like, we'd be fine with that. <laughs> okay. uh, so, you know. That means get out early. Yeah. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of political pressure involved yeah, with yeah, that. Yeah. So, um, so, and we were, we were kind of, you know, thinking like, well, the space is a little too big based on sort of our reimagining of what this program could be like. And... Literally, like it was one of those like postcards in the mail. Like, there's this space and like, I know that guy. Yeah, I thought it was long gone. You know, like I, you know, right. who stuff. would let this? Stay yeah, on the market? I, I figured. You know, Alan had just like sold it a long time ago, and uh, so I called him up. I'm like, hey, are you? he's like, yeah, like let's let's make a deal. So, uh, so we came over, and you know, it was really fast. Like we had our first meeting in like January. And uh, now, Dwight, what year is this? This is uh, 2017. Okay. okay. So in January, you know, we came in and looked back over the space and gave it some real serious consideration. And, you know, in March, we signed a lease with him. Wow. And, you know, he was out, you know, basically July 1. Okay. <laughs> so, like he was, okay. he was ready to go and we were ready to take it. So That's... It, was, it was a frantic, you know, four months, but yeah. it worked out really well. That's great. And then we went from a you know thirty thousand square foot campus down to this six thousand square foot building, so right. there were some choices to make. But, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it did allow uh, some really cool things to happen. One of them was all our gear was five years old, so we're like, okay, that's a lifetime. Let's get rid of all of it, mm-hmm. and we basically refreshed everything at the same time. Right. So that's good. Yep. So it was good. It was a good move. Before you and I get in the music business, because I want to talk to you about the business of music. Mm-hmm. You were talking about some of the curriculum, which is 
fascinating to me because the depth and thought Mm -hmm. that you've put into the curriculum Mm -hmm. isn't just being a guy who was in the music business, the entertainment Mm -hmm. business. It's not just um, scratching the surface stuff. Right. You've actually taken time and thought through the curriculum. Mm -hmm. But why don't you take us through what just at at top level, what that two-year curriculum is. And I really want you to touch on some of the the course offerings Mm -hmm. that they they, uh, have to take as part of that curriculum. Sure. So uh, I'll I'll talk first about how it was developed a little bit. Okay. Maybe that's the best way because the curriculum is, should always be a very dynamic thing. And that's one of my problems with traditional education is it doesn't change. Um, So what we did is, you know, I polled everybody in the industry and that I knew and asked them, like, what do people need to know? Why would you hire them? And they developed kind of six founding principles for us. Um, and one of those, three of them are kind of macro and three of them are more micro. But mm-hmm. um, the three micro ones, which is kind of gets into the curriculum detail was, you know, hey, if you're going to work in this industry, it takes a really broad knowledge. You can't just do one thing. You cannot just be an engineer. You know, probably right, right. and even especially if especially now, and even if you are an engineer, like it's not you're enough. only going to get hired if you can basically demonstrate knowledge outside of engineering. That's right. So your it, differentiating attribute will be outside of the core. Exactly. So it requires this really, you know, mile Broad. wide, six inches deep idea. But then one of those, you know, six inch holes, you have to be really good at. Right. right. If you're going to get hired as an engineer in a specialization doing vocals, you better be the best vocal engineer there is. Right. 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 So it's this broad depth of knowledge uh, coupled with like knowing one thing really well. Uh-huh. And that sort of set up how the curriculum was, was going to shake out. And uh, so those are like two of our principles in our what we call our essential six where it requires broad net. And when I look at other programs, I would only find one or the other. That's my point. I would find a program that would be all about making you the best audio engineer, but I couldn't ask you how to do a copyright if you graduated from it. Or I'd find a program that was all surface level. Like I understand how to turn the power on a board, but I have no idea what setting me on a compressor is. Right. (laughs) Right, right. So, you know, like I, and that sort of, Uh, that sort of shaped out that like, could we squeeze this inside of two years if we were really focused and dedicated? And, you know, yeah, it takes a lot. It's a, it's a big program. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I can do that. I can make that work inside of two years. Um, so that's how the, the program shook out from. And every month uh, that we're here, for the most part, we meet with uh, industry pros. We put together a panel in audio production, music business, events. We bring them in here and we say, who are you hiring and why? What, what should I be teaching? And, you know, I'm a small institution. So when they tell me something, I can change it there. You can be agile. I don't have to go, well, let me kick this up to my board right. of regions who will run it through. Some or my board of regions is just agreed. Accrediting body in New York about somebody who's never worked in the business before. And I like to Good tell the story of we about seven years ago, we we're still at the old campus is the summer before we left. We brought in our video panel. We said, who are you hiring and why? And they said, drone pilots. And I go, oh, <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, of course. Right. And I'm like, okay. So we happened to have a video course going on that term. And I went to my video instructor. I said, are you, author-? he's like, yeah, I'm authorized. I'm like, I'm, tell me which drone to buy. I'm going to buy one tomorrow. And, you know, two days later, our students are out flying drones. Right. Like, okay, that's why this exists. Not yeah. because, well, let me talk about adding that to the curriculum. There's some separate specialized elective three or four years from now. Right? After the, something's already displaced <laughs> yeah, the drone. After, after we've got fully there's, automated. There's a thing called a rocket ship. Right. Uh, fully automated drones we control from our minds or exactly, something. Right? Exactly. Exactly. You know? <laughs> so that's what, the, 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 those are the pillars, this idea of broad and deep. Mm-hmm. Now, it sounds like this conference you went to when they were saying, you know, it's changing mm-hmm. and you said changed. Mm-hmm. It sounds like this has made a, one hell of an impression on you. Yeah. In a lot of the ways that you run this. Yeah this uh, business now, right? Yeah. This organization. Yeah. And I think, you know, as long as we can keep that edge of always asking, you know, always inquiring, I tell my students and they don't always like to hear it, but they're not my client. That's right. My, the music industry is my client. Right. right. And that's kind of a hard truth when they're like, well, why do I, I'm like, well, I don't care if you learn this or not, but they, they do. do, right? And they're the ones hiring. <laughs> they're the you. ones hiring you, right? right. I'll hire you. You don't know it, but <laughs> right, <laughs> I'm not hiring, so good luck. <laughs> uh, you know, right. so like that's like keeping that out in front of us all the time. That who do we really serve? We serve uh, the industry. Yeah, and you know, our our students have employed us to do that. Yes, uh, and if we keep that that paradigm, 
aligned that way, then I think we, we get a really good feel for how the industry, how education should work in a perfect world. Yeah. So right before you walked in the studio, we just did a podcast with a gentleman who runs a, a leadership firm, leadership mm-hmm. growth development firm. Mm-hmm. And one of the things, and he's been a friend of mine for a decade, and we kind of work on a lot of acc- accounts together where I need leadership to step up because they can't live up to the brand. Right. Or he has leadership that's tremendous, but there's no brand. Right, right. <laughs> uh, and he talks about this idea of service. So I think when you're saying to the students, listen, it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. Where because I know who I'm serving, and that's and if you want to serve me, mm-hmm. you got to be able to serve them. Yep, and I'm yep. just right. Yep, and th- that kind of authenticity is unbelievable. And it reminds me also is another guest we've had on the podcast, which was Shadowbox Live. Mm-hmm. It's the same kind of thing with their meta performers. They're saying, listen, this doesn't have to be the last stop. Yeah, <laughs> there could be many other things out there, but I've got to train you for all these things. Yeah. And we call them meta performers at Shadowbox. Yep. Because they're broad based. Yep. We have a alumni who's a, who's who's a meta performer oh, oh, at, at Shadowbox. Oh, so, so really, <laughs> yeah. that's awesome. That's awesome. You probably know so more good, than I do. So good, like that tells me we're doing our job. Exactly. Right? You know, exactly. That, All right. Now let's talk a little bit about the music business. Mm-hmm. So you got your most experience in the music business inside Nashville. Would you say I in did. that decade? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that's absolutely fair. Or okay. I worked in Nashville in a lot of roles from starting out in recording studios to mu- moving to music publishers yeah. uh, to working pretty closely with a lot of artist managers and record labels. Yeah. Right. So that's, right. that's, it's, that's the depth. Yep. And I, um, we were talking before the podcast, I kind of grew up in the New York scene mm-hmm. because the Psychedelic Furs helped us get a record deal. Right. And our first recording was with Tim Butler, the bass player from the Furs. Yeah. Stayed at our apartment on Summit Avenue. That's all I need to say. <laughs> <laughs> Psychedelic Furs yeah, in a yeah, yeah, small, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. little bed. Yeah. It's probably one of those roll-out cushions right, you get right. from Walmart. Right. He's sleeping there with his red hair all roostered up. And we went to music hall yeah. to record. Yeah. And I think, I don't, I remember. That such a treasure. Yeah. yeah, I love that. I love that place. I, it, it reminds me of like it, at its core what what the music industry is, which is yeah. you know full of just entrepreneurs oh. doing their thing. Yeah, right? if those floors could talk. Yep. Right. <laughs> right. You might not like what they have to say. I know. I'm just saying. Good thing they're silent. Yes. <laughs> After we did that first thing at Music Hall, uh, we did it for a, a project in Cleveland. It was called Project A. I can't remember the gentleman who put it on, but so we had one track on an album. There were 12 local bands, blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. But ours was produced by somebody who was already somebody. So that helped us. Right, right. To to get noticed. Yeah. The song was probably not very good at the time, but that gave us a differentiating attribute. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the idea of thinking long and deep, you know, how can we differentiate? Yeah. But I grew up, you grew up in the music business, if you will, on the streets of Nashville, and I grew up in the streets of New York. Right. Visiting them and being introduced to all the people that they knew in the business, yeah. including entertainment attorneys and, you know, mm-hmm. some were high end <laughs> and some were lower end <laughs> is the way that I can put it. <laughs> but the beauty is that when I saw the depth of the curriculum here, it made me smile mm. because it's honest yeah. of what you need to know. Right, right. Because anybody well, can sell the uh, Scott Steinecker, uh, yeah. as you know, was yeah. on the podcast. I think his thing just released a couple of weeks ago. But he, t- you know, he's a guy that also tells you he's going to do something. It's loyal. It's long. It's deep. Mm-hmm. He gets that. Mm-hmm. And there's many, many promoters in his role that wouldn't have yep. gotten that. Yep. And so when you th- think about that idea of, I, I think you were saying wide and deep. And I think yeah. that's, I think it's great because I think, again, it's authentic and they can then take this. And if it doesn't work in the entertainment business, they can certainly right. audible yeah. any place else, yep. right? That's because right. of the knowledge. Yeah. And, you know, yeah, that's that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that we both agreed on, and I didn't know that you were teaching your students this, and I think it's awesome, is that it's not a talent business. Mm-hmm. And let me say that really slowly and deeply. It is not a talent business. It's not talent it's driven. N- <laughs> It is not. And uh, you and one of your uh, students, (laughs) we were talking about this idea of its relationship. It's not even money driven, which is is like bizarre to think about that I'm in business, but money is of a secondary concern. Yeah. And you're totally right. And um, 
I've been in contact with the guy who signed us, uh, Michael Rosenblatt, who's still in the business and great A&R guy for Geffen for many years. And then I think he went to MCA. But him and I were having this same conversation. If artists only knew mm -hmm. that it's really about, and, and the people who work in the industry, that it's really about relationship building. And I know that that's a generic cliche. Yeah. But it really isn't. In the one industry where it matters most, yeah. it's the music, it's the entertainment business. Yeah, it, I mean, absolutely. We, you know, we... I, there's just countless stories of and how when we say, you know, Nashville's high school with money or music industry high school, it's it's also because it's so small. Right. You know, it's also because of this idea that you know, people that ha perpetually crossed my path who I mm -hmm. met 15, 20, 25 years ago that, oh, yeah, right. And, you know, yes, we pick right back up. We have a great relationship. Yes. Even if we haven't totally been uh, in con we we've been rooting each other on from afar. You know, we had uh, someone on two days ago who, uh, who I've been rooting for for a long time who won some Grammys. And I remember rooting him on when, That's when, he awesome. was, when he was up. And then when he popped up to visit with us, I was like, I remember when I was that rooting, is, you know, and he's like, I knew you were, right? Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's the point of yeah. the arts though, right? Yep. Th that is arts. Yep. yep. That's, that's creatives. Yep. I know this when you brought this up firsthand and I wanted to wait for the podcast to tell this little story. So... I had a um, Lou Reed's entertainment attorney mm -hmm. helped us on our deal. Cool. So he says, I got this guy that I know and I'll fly him out. Where are you, where are you playing next? And I said, well, we don't, we don't go to New York. We're not, we're, mm -hmm. we're in the Midwest. Right, right. He goes, well, where? And I said, well, we're playing at this little RHA festival in Michigan. It's an outdoor mm -hmm. festival mm -hmm. put on by a college. So he says, well, I'm going to send this A&R guy out. Mm -hmm. and I said, all right. And so this entertainment attorney doesn't come with him. But so we go to play this show and there might be, I think we'll have to go on at 11 o'clock in a college campus. I'm talking about 11 a.m. <laughs> 11 a.m. I mean, that's not the time slot, right? No, it's this not is, the time slot. This is the opening act of the opening act of the opening act of the roadies. Tomorrow's act. Uh, tomorrow's act. <laughs> that's right. So I, I said to my uh, cousin Rick, I said, well, so what do you want to do? And he goes, well, let's just do our normal show. And I said, well, I don't know if the guy's even here. He goes, it doesn't matter because let's just go. Yeah. So... We do it and our little, our, our dogs in the crowd. And there's 30 college people that, you know, we had not even played any bars there. It was just an outdoor festival. Right. But anyway, we did very well. We were on our own little Grateful Dead moment of doing some cool stuff was mm -hmm. happening on the stage. You could feel it. Yeah. And we get done and this guy comes around and he introduces himself and it's Michael Rosenblatt who signed, you know, as yeah. you know, Depeche Mode, Madonna, yeah. some other artists. And he said that was... Well, I'll just tell you what he said. They said that was unfucking believable. Yeah. And he said, but that's not what all, all that matters. Mm. And I said, <laughs> okay. And we just met. Right. And I I'm said, I'm really ready to receive Buddhist yeah. wisdom at this point, right? <laughs> I don't know if I'm ready. Let me get these pants off. <laughs> right. right. And he says, and the student will appear when the, yes, when the yes. teacher will appear when the student is ready to receive the information, right? <laughs> so he says, he says, the other thing is here. I want to know what, I want to know what you're about. Mm -hmm. What are you guys about? Mm -hmm. Articulate to me the vision of this band. Right. I didn't know at the time, Dwight, mm -hmm. but he wanted to make sure that I was a marketable human e human being right. inside of a product called a band. Right. He was teaching me branding yeah. right as a positional right. moment right, right then. And so we ended up talking for a very long time. I like your music, but do I like you? Exactly. Right? Otherwise, I'm not going to get... Otherwise, we're not going to do out. business. Yep. We're out. People like to work with people they like. And love. Yeah. Yeah. So and, be likable. <laughs> and that's when you said it's not a talent business. It's a relation business. Always be likable. Yeah. Right? Yep. And always, always be liking. Always. Yep. Not judging. Nope. Liking. The industry is full of cynics. Yeah. Yeah. Of it, course. It really is. And, you and, know? and we, we all get there. Like, yeah. you know, eventually. But... <laughs> If we can stave it off until we retire, then it's we're much better. better. Then better. you're just a curmudgeon. We get, we, get, we, we get more. Yeah. Then you're respected cynic. Yeah. With a pipe. <laughs> it's better to be, it's better to be a cynic who has lots of gold records yes. than a cynic who's just a cynic. Exactly. <laughs> it feels better. <laughs> People respect your cynicism. <laughs> so um, the next time we flew out to New York City, I think I met, or it might've been LA. I can't remember, but I, I met his parents. It was the next move. So then I realized, oh, this mm -hmm. is what this is about. Mm -hmm. Now, I came to find out if Michael is a friend, and that's how he is. Right. It's just loyalty meets loyalty, and I believe in you, you believe in me. Let's go do this thing, and then we got a record contract. Yeah. So 
it's just so, tr- it, it's so unbelievable to me that you're taking the time to do, you know, like you said, that the pillars that you built the institution on are still wrapped around this idea yeah. of relationship yeah. building. And it's, it, you know, to, to piggyback off that, it's based on soft skills. Yeah. Right. You know, which I don't know if I can teach, but I can certainly coach. Right. Right. You know, right. and we have a whole soft skill assessment program here. The students get evaluated uh, on it by their advisors, by their peers. They self-evaluate. Uh, we have an acronym for it. I told you we love acronyms. Yes. It's called HAPPY. Yes. It stands for Humble, Adaptable, Present, Persistent, and Innovative. And wow. it came, fr- again, like, I, people are always I like, mean, why you- don't we have t-shirts that how, say that? How, how did, how'd you come up with this? I'm like, I didn't. Like, the industry told me. that. Right. Like, we, we just looked through our notes from... <laughs> From, you know, 50 advisory panels and said, what are people saying? Let me, let me highlight hire? these. Yeah, uh, there it is. Humility, adaptability, uh, present, you know, yeah. being persistent, you know, and we tell our students. And innovative. Yeah. We tell our students, like, you know, it's a lifestyle choice. Right, right. Which there's, there's careers that aren't. And, yeah. But <laughs> you got to figure it out pretty quick because yeah. once you make this commitment, at least, at least until you're in your mid-30s, you know, like, you, you're only going to, that's the only time you're going to have the time and energy to pour into living this lifestyle. And then hopefully you'll get to a point where you can back off of it a little bit and become an elder statesman yeah. of our industry, it's which called, happens at like 35. You don't it, have to be does. that old. Right. Or 31. <laughs> right. It's called coasting. Yeah. But, uh, you, you know, it is based on lots of, lots of soft skill ideas because, you know, you can train anybody to do anything. Like that's, right. that's not the hard part. No. You know, the hard part is finding people you want to train. So tell me a little bit about, uh, you were talking about, when we were talking earlier, you were talking about their capstone program. Yeah. You used a phrase that I just love and I started <laughs> smiling. I couldn't take notes because I was smiling. And you said, well, we teach them, you know, what their job search should be and what's the side hustle. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. Yep. So in the business, you and I know yeah. what we mean by a side hustle. Yeah. Yeah. But tell our listeners why you think that should be part of a master's yeah. curriculum. So there, there's, a, there's a couple really foundational reasons. One is... You know, this is a business of entrepreneurs. I think being a musician really at its core is being an entrepreneur, right? Like you're creating something and then you're starting to look around at who's going to pay for this? Who's going to want to see this? Who's going to want to help me? It's the first thing you it's think about. It's the very first thing you think of, right? Yeah, yeah. And so there's this kind of inherent quality in musicianship that parallels so nicely with entrepreneurship. And, and, and you're in a business of entrepreneurship. So you're immediately pitching to other people all the time. Who are also just like you, right? right? And when you think about entrepreneurship in particular, what do I really want as an entrepreneur? I want to be excited, right? Yeah, I want to be I, on I, fire. I want you to tell, I want to see your enthusiasm and I want that to make me want to be a part of it. Yeah. But that's what music is, right? Here's My money here, or my here, mind, that's how you get it. Here's my music. Up. Can you get excited about it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm all in. Same thing with business, right? Here's, here's my business idea. Does it excite you? Yeah, yeah, right. So, and that's you know that's part skill, but I think mostly craft, mm-hmm. right? At the end of the day, like it is, you have this idea, and you have to figure out how to communicate it. So, we are an entrepreneurship. Our actual program title is Music Industry Entrepreneurship. Right, program. right. And so, while they get a, a core course on entrepreneurship, where they have to walk through all the business logistics of being an entrepreneur, from you know tax filings to uh, or articles of incorporation and organization and all this other stuff. When they get one of their last classes, a careers class here, they have to create a side hustle. Okay. Which is this idea that m- I want my day gig to be X. Mm-hmm. But the simple fact of the matter is X might not pay the rent right away. Mm-hmm. So what's Y? <laughs> right. What can I do that still taps into my skills that either I hope ultimately becomes X, mm-hmm. which, you know, for some of us, it does. Mm-hmm. Right. But if it doesn't, it gives me a, a good, nice way to parlay what I know into more things and more things mean more relationships, more relationships mm-hmm. mean more opportunity. You know, it's kind of this self feeding circle. So, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. So as a part of their final classic review, they get two career courses. They get one at the very beginning, which is all about developing their personal brand, establishing their brand pillars, uh, creating everything from business cards to website to style guides. And who, here's who I am visually and how I present myself to the world. And the last class they get is about uh, the job and relationship cultivating and, hmm. and finding the job and, and how did awesome. I parlay these relationships right? Is there some opportunities I left? And my side hustle, mm-hmm. right? So like if, if I have to wait a little bit, if some of these things take a little while to play out. This is what I'll be doing. This is what I'll be doing. Yeah. Right, right. So over the years of doing this, 
<laughs> I, I have two questions. <laughs> First question would be, do they do the side hustles have to be approved? Yes. Uh, they have to, well, they have to present them as a business. Yeah, okay. They have to basically say, this is what I would, this is my money that I need for, you know, my initial advertising of my side hustle, you know, my my own payroll, what I think I can derive yeah, out of it. Out of this hustle. Yeah, here's how it's organized. I'll set myself up as an LLC. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So has there ever been a side hustle, since it has to be approved, mm -hmm. has there ever been a side hustle that you thought, mm, maybe I shouldn't approve that <laughs> <laughs> because see, that's the hustle I would have well, brought you. That, well, that's that's where. It, okay, so there's two answers to that question. One is if if you brought me a hustle that I didn't believe in, that's not my problem. Right, right. That's right, your problem. Right, you're you gotta right. convince me. That's right. Right. Like, but see, I think I'm, I'm good at that. I, okay, I, I'm not. Then in which case, you know, I'm gonna say sure. Right, right. Yeah, yeah right. I, like I, you said, because you'll get excited too because yeah, it's an entrepreneurial right, like moment. Maybe go back to the drawing board. Maybe, right. maybe you've got the kernel of okay. an idea here that's not really fleshed out. Maybe you've got the great idea, but you just presented it to me wrong. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Right. Like, which I, I'm, I I'm a creative, so. Pitch it to me creatively. Right, like, right. Don't tell me that you're gonna bake cookies right. and put it up on a PowerPoint. <laughs> bring me bring me the cookies. Where's the cookie? Yeah, bring me the cookie, right? <laughs> bake it in real time in your easy bake oven, right? And convince me that you can make the best cookies. <sighs> right. Okay, okay. So you you do do some of that nuance to yeah. their to some of their hustles Absolutely. to help them be successful. Absolutely, right? Okay. Because, you know, I, I, when I was 19 years old, I had lots of ideas. Mm -hmm. Oh, right? yeah, we do. Right? And I don't think they were all necessarily bad ideas, but they weren't massaged, right? right? They may have not been fully fleshed out, right? right? Right, And it's like, man, you got all the enthusiasm in the world, which will get you to the 49% mark. Right. So take me, take me over halfway. That's so interesting that you say that. So when we would we would bring in, um, when I was in the full agency business, we would bring in interns uh, from Ohio State, usually or CCAD, into the agency to work a summer or two. And but what I would do to create innovation uh, mm -hmm. creatively is I would move their ideas to the front of the line mm -hmm. just to push some of my senior level people. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. And even if I knew the ideas weren't going to float. Right. Well, I had this one aggressive intern, we'll say. <laughs> Motivated. <laughs> this one individual <laughs> thought every idea, yeah, every idea that he or she had mm -hmm. was the next great the idea. Golden idea. Oh, yeah. And and I was just a fool. I mean, yeah. And and he or she believed this passionately. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, a scarface kind of yeah, passion. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> An intimidating type of passion. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm going to teach you a lesson. We're going to, Circoni, we're going to invest in this. Yeah. And th it wasn't a lot of money. Yeah, yeah. But to them it was. Yeah. And it failed miserably. Right, right. Within days. Right, right. During their internship. Right. So they came up to me and said, well, that didn't work up. And I said, well, let me tell you what a great idea is without mm -hmm. strategy. Mm -hmm. And he or she said, what's that? And I said, bankruptcy. Yeah. Yep. Great ideas don't matter. <laughs> yep. A great idea with a strategy matters. Yep. And, right? the, and you also point out a really important idea that I teach our students is people don't invest in ideas, they invest in people. Right. 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 So, you know, like I'm, I'm banking on your capability to, to execute your idea, which doesn't mean that I may be even necessary. I, I better believe in the idea, but the ideas are all over the place. Right. right? You don't have to I'm, be part I'm of the banking on your specific capability to do it. So you have to convince me of your own capabilities right and, and your like i said enthusiasm goes a long way there and when it comes to that class too it's like let's let's get the removal of any bias you may feel towards me we have we have them take it to score uh mm -hmm. they they have to pitch their side hustle to score yeah, and get awesome. and get uh, somebody outside's perspective yeah. who doesn't even know anything maybe about music right right right, like, right, right. well like if you can convince somebody who doesn't know anything about music that that's a good good. idea right then well, then you're really on to something right. because you, you you know, be a record label and try and convince a bank to invest. They're going to be right. like, wait, what? what? How's this model? <laughs> wait, give me this business model. You're going to lose money on 99% of so, what you do. You're going to break even on 0.9% of what you do. And 0.1% of what you do is going to make money for right. the other 99.9%. Right. Get I'm, out of here. Not right. <laughs> there is no line of credit for that. There is no line of credit for that. And, Where's the house? Show me the and, asset and, in the house. And how are you going to know that any of this succeeds? Like, right. Eh, just, What's your measurement? My feeling. <laughs> yeah. Instincts is a measurement tool now. <laughs> Welcome to the entertainment business. Yeah. <laughs> but that feeds into two things there. When I got out of the entertainment business, I started writing. I had like 80 bucks. Mm -hmm. 
And I had my, I had a red Alvarez acoustic guitar that I still have. Nice. I started, you know, writing jingles. Mm -hmm. you know, I did mm -hmm. a little jingle. Yep. I didn't have it. I was broke. Yeah. So I did a little jingle and, you know, they said, well, what do you want to charge? And I said, ah, for doing a jingle, I hate jingles. So I just threw out a number. Right. I don't want to do a jingle. I was, I used to be an artist. Now I'm doing a jingle. Right. What the hell? Right. Right. Sure. It's, it's, so anyway, long story short. Jingles pay money. Yeah. I, well, so I learned that. <laughs> they do. Yeah. And it's real quick money. Yeah. And they're not hard. Nope. There's no torment in your soul nope. about a jingle. Nope. <laughs> so anyway, that's what I did. Yeah. And I then gradually got in the agency business. But to your point, uh, I remember talking to people and they said, well, how can you go from rock and roll to the, to the ad agency business? How, how'd that happen? I said, oh, it's a, it's a ad agency business is a joke. It's so easy <laughs> compared to the rock and roll business. Right, right. As what you just said, yeah, the business yeah. model. Yeah. And I said, but I have a secret weapon. <laughs> and I'm sitting with these two older ad execs, right. one male and one female, and we're having drinks and they're teaching me the business. Yeah. And these two people are icons in the ad business right. here in Columbus. They're Don Draper, right? Yeah, they are <laughs> right. locally. Right, right. And I said, I'm an artist who's not embittered. I have passion. Yeah. So I started the agency using passion as the energy, right? Mm -hmm. And that came from what entertainment taught me. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's a great, awesome. that's a great point. Yeah. And to that, you also said that you guys actually have a curriculum. Inside your curriculum is personal brand building. Yes. Okay, so tell me about this. <laughs> a, back in my day, I'm dating myself. There was no... So <laughs> like, what? So there's a couple... Re I mean, the reasons that it should be kind of obvious. Yeah. Uh, uh, one is, you know, there's a lot of hobbyists, right? Mm -hmm. And what distinguishes hobbyists from professionals? Well, one of them is you have a strong sense of who you are and you can present it, right? Anybody can say, I write songs, right? Yeah. Uh, but I see your album cover and right. I'm like, yeah, okay. He writes songs, <laughs> right? And, you know, so, so getting, so we walk them through uh, this process of like identifying five brand pillars, things they want people to sort of know about themselves. Uh, you know, they go through an exercise where, uh, they have to create an elevator pitch based on those brand pillars. Okay. Um, and may I ask, uh, do you define what the brand pillars should be? They can be anything. They can be anything. They, okay. they they brainstorm on them, then they prioritize them, and then we help them massage them. Okay. Like, okay. What does that What does that really mean? Yeah. Yeah. Or that's too esoteric. Yeah. Exactly. Be more specific. Nobody okay. Nobody's going to get that. So okay. is there something more concrete? That would be mine. <laughs> You'd be like whatever. Like Michael Stipe from REM. What are I, you talking about? I want people about? to think I'm ephemeral, <laughs> and I want them. <laughs> right. <laughs> but at the same time, extremely grounded. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, let's try something else here. <laughs> um, so, so you help them massage yeah, that. They massage, that's important. Yeah, they massage that. I mean, you're 19, right? What right. Are you, or 18. What do you What do you know, right? right. You're, you're You're figuring this out. And the the cool thing is, is they do it and they go through this whole exercise from creating their brand, creating their brand pillars, elevator pitch, uh, style guide to business cards to, to collateral. Yeah, to all the collateral from putting it, doing a traditional resume to create a resume, yeah. you know, with it incorporate those elements and then finally into a website. And they get all this done and then they're like, I hate it. I'm like, awesome. Right, you're on the right path. <laughs> you're on the right path. Yeah. So they get to redo it a year later. Like, yeah. I, I, I'm sorry, but you have to live with it now. This, you made this so, effort. So now. that is brilliant. Yeah. So you let the process teach them. Yeah. Because when you get the, after you're done writing the book, of course you hate it because you're yeah. on to the next book. Yeah, right. And I'm that's, like, that, that's, yeah, or, or the song or whatever, right? right, right? right like, right. cool. Like, when they come back for that second careers class, the first thing they do is like, everybody wants to rebrand. I'm like, that's perfect. Now you have a good sense of what worked about your brand. You've been, you've been field testing it for a year. That's right? a perfect And, word. you know, you have a good, uh, whether people get you or don't get you, mm -hmm. and you can move on and, and try something else. Unbelievable. Okay. So, you also teach, and I, again, we didn't bring this up when we were talking earlier, but you teach songwriting. We do. Now, I find this <laughs> interesting. <laughs> Man, um, songwriting is the easiest thing in the world. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> tell that to all the people in Nashville. So, yeah. But, but, but tell me, how, how do you even approach putting your arms around that such a, in my book, right. a broad, broad So subject. So, okay, so... I'll, sometimes I'll teach that class and, ah. and sometimes I will have um, someone like Nick D teach that class. Mm -hmm. Okay. So okay. it kind of depends where we are. Okay. Um, so an established songwriter or myself who comes at it from the other side, which is working in music publishing, where my yep. job was to tell songwriters to write better songs. That was mm -hmm. pretty much my whole job. Mm -hmm. uh, we're going to talk about <laughs> we'll that. We'll talk about that. Okay. So, you know, in all honesty, when it comes to songwriting, it's less about them getting 
a number one hit and really more about them understanding the process of what makes a great song. So okay. tell us. So, yeah, great question. You know, like if, if it were that easy, right, we probably all, wouldn't know. be here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but, you know, there are certain things like when everybody starts out songwriting, for example, or when they first listen to songs, they're not paying attention to structure. They're not paying attention Verse, to the length. pre-chorus, chorus, right, third right? part. Right, like you've got these epic, you know, nine minute things, right? And it's like, well, what are you really trying to say, right? right. Uh, so what we, what I do when I teach that class is by actually, I can find them to specific things. So like one of the first things I will have them do is like, you are going to write me a uh, hip hop song. Okay. But it has to be a love song. Okay. 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 Interesting. Yeah. Right. So now, now you, you have to eliminate pretty much every cliche you think about hip hop. Yeah. They're all gone. They're all gone. So you have to write me and you, the love song has to be about someone. It can't be how much you love cake. Right. 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 It has to Not be an a, a legitimate, object. make me feel something love song. And so, you know, they'll, awesome. they'll go through that. And then I'll say, all right, now you've got to write me a country song. Okay, but here's the trick. It can't you can't use the word pickup, dog, beer, whiskey. Yeah, you can't use any country cliche in it. And the song has to be about the road or a place or a location. Okay. Right? So, you know, and you, you can see how people's gears turn when they start thinking. Like that box creates a frame of reference. A, a good set of parameters. That's right. Write me a country song. Okay. You're like, no problem. Right. right? And it's going to, or you'll be like, I, I don't even like country. Right. But I tell you, well, did you ever travel? Yeah. Did you like travel? Yeah. Where's the favorite place you went? Sedona. Write me a country song about Sedona. Right. Oh. Right. <laughs> now I can do that. That's and great. Then for their final thing in that class, uh, I always have them write a pop song, but it's really restrictive. It has to be verse, chorus, verse, chorus, bridge, chorus. Okay. okay. It has to be under three minutes. It has to be greater than 90 BPM. Okay. So okay. it has to be mid yeah. to up tempo. Yeah. Right. No journey. No, and, 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 no it, balance. and it can't be a love song. Okay. So, uh, except it has to be a love song about something else besides romantic love. So yeah. about, you know, like think like soak up the sun or mm. it has to be about mm. the day or it has to be positive. I said, I want a three minute positive song. Okay. Like, that's what gets played on With radio. that song structure. With that song structure. Okay. And I said, you know, and I always give them like, you can stray. Like if you write a country song and it ends up a little more Americana yeah. or a little more Southern rock, I don't care. Right, right? right. Write me a pop song. But, you know, if you write me a hip hop song, you know, it, it's, I shouldn't hear banjo in it, probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah probably. <laughs> right? Unless they're very creative. So they all do this and they, they have to do most of them as co-writes oh. until they get to the last one that they have to write by themselves. Okay. And then... So when you say the last one, how... That's how many, the pop song. Okay, yeah. okay, the third song. Yeah. That's your third um, one. And then as a class, because this class is actually a two-part class, the second part of that class is we pick the best songs as a class, we, we, we rework them as a class, and then we produce them. Okay, but not from the engineer side, from the producer side. Yes. What are course. we thinking in right. terms of instrumentation and tempo and feel and vibe and all? And, and at the end, you know, I really don't care what type of song we get or get or songs we get. It's a Do you understand the process? Do you understand how difficult this is? If you're like, this is really hard, you're like, yeah. Why do you think it's so hard to find a good song? Right. <laughs> you came into this class going, well, that song I heard on the radio was garbage. I'm like, Okay. Write one. Write one. <laughs> exactly. That's it. That's exactly it. Like, if you can write that, you don't need to be here. Right? Right. And they're like, I can write that. I'm like, go ahead. <laughs> 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 and if I, it's like, man, this really isn't. Like, it's not hooky. It doesn't stick. Right? Like, yeah, that's hard. You know? Like, did you start You know, it is hook? really good. <laughs> it is really good to hear you. I feel like a soulmate. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, we were just talking on the last podcast how many songs I probably wrote in the toll, in and around the toll, and it's mm -hmm. probably pushing a thousand. Yeah. yeah. If you count every riff and the things we recorded, oh, yeah. Dwight, yeah. that were never published, it's, yeah. it's, it's hard. Yeah, it's, it's incredibly difficult. And, and then I tell them, like, well, look at it this way. If you're an artist, you have this whole lifetime before your first record deal to write your first no, great know. songs, right? Like you've got your, you've got your dozen greats. It's called you the play sophomore. Them out. Yeah, right? Now you've got 18 months. So it's not just about if you took your whole life to write songs, it's how strong that muscle is, right? How well developed it is that you can write at the bus at 2 a.m. in the morning, right? And write a great song, just as great as the song you put on your first record that became the single. So, and... That's, you know, like going through the process just once or twice starts to show them like, man, this is really hard. And production is hard. And songwriting is hard. Like, because we all think we can do it until we have to do it. <laughs> so this is why I started this podcast. Yeah. 
ironically. Yeah. What we're coming to right now. Yeah. Yeah. Because the idea of getting the brand back together, right? Or getting the band back together. It's, it, I, I want to stand up for, because I heard this mm-hmm. my whole time in rock and roll. Mm-hmm. About, oh, it's a rock and roll life. Oh, that's easy. This is easy. Mm-hmm. That's easy. It's not. Mm-mm. I mean, I've had conversations with, you know, some of the people that we met on the road. Yeah. Some artists that you would know. Mm-hmm. Produ- and, and it's hard. It's hard. And they're smart. Yeah. And they're hard workers. Oh, yeah. It is not easy. No. If there's and, something and else fa- you can do, do it. <laughs> do because it. Because this is very difficult. You know, I tell I tell my students all the time, like, let me let me lay out a day for you on the road. So you're up at 4.30 to go do your 5 a.m. radio. Mm-hmm. Okay. You're going to do your 5 a.m. radio from 5 to 6, 5 to 7.30. Maybe it's a little longer. Mm-hmm. Uh, you're going to hop back on the bus. You're going to go to the hotel. You're going to get your day room. Mm-hmm. Right? You're going to be there, catch a three-hour nap. Yeah, it's time, maybe. It's time for sound check. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yep. You're going to go do your sound check. Uh, you're going to go backstage. You're going to do your pre-meet and greet yep. kind of with, with the Any pe- pressers. Any in pressers, the- right? In right. between there, right? right? You're going to go out. You're going to pour your all your energy out on mm-hmm. stage for two hours. Mm-hmm. And you're it gonna, might even be a great show. Yeah. Then you're going to go backstage and you're going to mm-hmm. have to do your meet and greet with your fans, mm-hmm. right? And then other things can happen. And then other things can happen. <laughs> and then, so you're loading out at 1 a.m. Mm-hmm. And you're catching four hours of sleep on the bus. Mm-hmm. And then you're going to do it again. <laughs> for a now, lot of days. Now, do that for, right. uh, forget about the people who can do it for 280 days a year. Right. Try doing it for 100 sometime. Right. We were just talking about that. See if you don't, like, right. I tell all of them, like, you have the experience to go out with a band for a week. Do it. Do it. And right. And, and oh yeah, by the way, in between here, we gotta write some songs for your next. I was just album. gonna say now here, <laughs> right? That's one thing that's happening. Then there's a whole other, so, and you gotta have your conversations with your manager about your sponsorships and your whole, endorsements. There's two worlds, yeah. Like all this, your business is moving on while you're pouring all your energy every day into your shows, and then you're expected to come back and be hyper creative for three months. Mm-hmm. Right, while you sit back and let people critique your art, and if mm-hmm. it's going to make it out and make it on the radio and be good enough, and we got to retract this, and you're going to lose all that. Cre- okay, now the record's done. It's time to go, to go again. again. <laughs> so I called this positive and negative addiction. Mm. That's what it is. Yeah, it's the constant Ouroboros. Yeah, it's that. It's that forty minutes every night that can hopefully carry you through. That's it. The next. 400 days, yeah. you know, over yeah. and over again. Yeah. And people have said to me, well, you guys were really, you know, you were really lucky on the road and da 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 because none of you felt any addictions. Mm-hmm. And I said, oh, we were already addicted. Right. <laughs> we were addicted when we decided to go down this path. Yeah. It's yeah. called the addiction of creativity. And people don't realize a lot of those addictions are maintained, are, are the result of trying to do this. Well, I, that's why I'm bringing yeah, it up yeah. because of what you just did in a beautiful narrative, yeah. by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, of a rock and roll life yeah. is that. And that is what causes that. And mm-hmm. you start to rely. And, and I didn't, I mean, yeah. we had no hit songs. We had a couple songs on MTV, but I, I, I didn't have any hit songs mm-hmm. or I wouldn't be here. Um, <laughs> or you might be. But, or I might be. Or I might be. I might have been here sooner. <laughs> but, but, but my point is, I can only imagine the pressures that are way above bands mm-hmm. that were hugely successful. But yeah. yes, even for those six or seven years when I was deeply in the business yeah. with two records on Geffen, yeah. it, was, it was as crazy as you said. Yeah. And I would always say to the band that there's two, e, there's, there's two E's that we're carrying. One is emotional all mm-hmm. night long, and then the other one is economic mm-hmm. all the next day. Yeah. Oh, if absolutely. You, That's great. If I love you that. don't yeah. balance those two E's, yeah. some, you're yeah. gone. Yeah. And, and, and then, th- like, you've, you know, we just talked about all this, but now you have a family. Right. <laughs> right. right. Add that dimension. Right. right. Add this, what most of our lives are consumed with on a day mm-hmm. in and day out. And you, you that's not even right. a, a part of the balanced equation, right? No. It's, it's why it's so hard. And I don't think, I think most people appreciate it. It's, it's incredibly challenging. Well, you, you are bringing up all <laughs> kinds of memories. So I have to tell you something else. I remember the first time we got off the road after a ex- long time on the road where day after day after day, because we were, Premier Talent used to book us. Yeah. And great agency. And they would say, uh, for on their uh, travel docs, it would say surface, meaning where you're arriving, the town you're arriving in. So we would always say, well, at least go four or five days, because we like to be a little burned out Mm -hmm. before we, you know, before we surface and get a day off. Yeah, yeah. So I remember 
after days on the road with the Ramones and we opened up for Eddie Money and just mm-hmm. some, the Hooters, some other mm-hmm. bands. And it was one after the other. I, I couldn't even, you know, you would think, oh, come on, Brad, you can distinguish Eddie Money from the Hooters and the Ramones. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you ever see that Simpsons bit where they have the spinal tap? And exactly. It's like, we were in Shelbyville last night yeah, and yeah. nobody rocks like it. He holds his guitar out. It says Springfield. Oh, on no, the back. you have to. Springfield. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, so, so I had the reverse of this happen to me. So we, this is before we get dropped, but we're trying to support the second record. So we're out on the road as much as we can be, Dwight. And I remember we had this little break and we were coming back through Columbus. Mm-hmm. And I called somebody or something. It might've been my, my good friend who was also an accountant or our accountant for us. Cause I had a bookkeeper in New York and I hired a redundant bookkeeper here yeah. to watch the yeah, counting. The of, audit, the audits. Right? I, that's what yeah. I did. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. I said, he goes, well, I'll just come pick you up. Because back then when we sold everything, we did, we had a we had a, a fruit truck that was our tour bus, yeah. right? And we rented trucks yeah. and our equipment. That's that was that our was house. It. That was it. Yeah. Yeah. There was no there was no apartment. There's no short power. No. <laughs> <laughs> so he says, Well, let's let's, you know, we're gonna you're gonna have two days off. So let's swing by the store. I said, hmm, the store. When was the last <laughs> time? <laughs> You mean the, you mean the convenience store? He goes, no, like like a grocery store. I, we don't go to those. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> and I just mean that it, I was so out of touch. Yeah, what do I get? Cottage cheese? Yeah. I can't. You know, we would <laughs> can't get, do that. It's gonna go bad in the bus fridge. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I need beef jerky <laughs> yes. and bologna that yes. is somehow never rot. Yes, and a, a many granola bars as we can take. Exactly, <laughs> stuff into our pockets. That's what I was telling Jamie Richardson from White Castle. I yeah. said the great thing about your hamburger, it tastes good three days later. Yeah, yeah. If well, I stuff it in the right pocket, <laughs> it's good. It won't go bad. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. Okay. Well, lastly, this has been wonderful, by the oh, way. thank you. I, I'm so glad that we had a chance to sit down and talk, especially in your beautiful facility that you host us in. <laughs> but tell me a little bit, um, with this pandemic and everything we've gone through, we yep. can sit together. And so this is wonderful yep. to be with other humans connecting. Yeah. But tell us a little bit about the Ohio uh, uh, Creatives Festival that you mm-hmm. guys have coming up in Dublin. Yep. You said it's the end of July. It is. July 30th and 31st. And this is exciting. Yep. Because it's really, <laughs> it's a festival. Yes, it's a festival. And we, yep. we, we'll be outside and oh, safe. Man. So tell us about what it is. And it's, you said it's 100% self-funded, right? Yes. So um, this is something every year, uh, a part of the curriculum at Groovy involves a big capstone project. Right. And the capstone project, so the students come up with a concept and then they have to execute it. Uh, and there's like three rules generally. One is you have zero dollars from us. <laughs> I'll front you, but you have to show us that okay, it's, okay. it's coming in. Yeah, like, like um, the record company, yeah. you front, but it's recuperable. <laughs> it's 100% recuperable. <laughs> and okay. it, it's coming out of your artist royalties. So. Yes, I know. I know where that money comes it's from. It's coming out of my royalties right, right. to recoup your expense. Um, so, um, and typically it has two other elements. One of them is it has to have a, a, a product, an event associated with it. So okay. uh, we mentioned Music Hall earlier. Two years ago, the, a class created a project that was uh, Columbus bands covering other Columbus bands. Called, yeah, which I think is cool. It's called the Seasides. And, no, uh, so be and they pressed Clever. it at Music Hall. They got all the licensing. They got all the digital distro. They pressed it wow. up at Music Hall. They, so this year, uh, the classes wanted to do a festival. So we kind of waived the product requirement because the festival is a big undertaking. Yeah, yeah. That is a product. That yes, kind of talk absolutely. About. It's a, it's a sure. So you can think of this as kind of a miniature South by Southwest experience that mm-hmm. they wanted to do because they haven't been able to go to South by. So right, this right. is going to be, they want to do it themselves, which I think is really admirable. So it'll have a film component. It will have a live music component and it will have panelists component to it as well. And they're doing it. They've been working with the city of Dublin to hold it down at Bridge Park, hold it in a couple of different venues. They're spreading out over a couple of venues. Love it. They're putting out an outside day stage. Uh, they'll have sort of a side stage. And then they're working uh, to screen some films. We're taking all their film submissions now. Um, and uh, yeah, so they'll be putting that on at the end of July. And it's open to the public. Yeah. Uh, but there'll also be like a badge. If you're interested in the music industry, there'll be uh, guest speakers and people who will come in and, and speak at the conference section. And how do I learn? I can learn more about this on the site. Yes. At- uh, you can go to grooveu.edu, but yeah. Ohio Creatives actually has its own website. Ohio Microsite. Cre- Ohio Creatives Festival. Com. There we go. Okay. Okay. So yeah, you could Google it, but yeah, yeah. there'd be how creativefestival.com. Yeah. So right now they're taking submissions and, and different things and they'll be rolling out tickets in short order. That's awesome. Great. Well, great having you on the podcast. Well, thank you, Brad. And, Generally and appreciate it. Yes, absolutely. And um, 
obviously, I'd love to talk again because I think, you know, we didn't even get to get into publishing. And so, Plugging. <laughs> yeah, and so, some of the other things that you and I have experienced that I think would just be interested for the listeners yeah, to hear about. I think it would be cool too. Yeah, inside and out of the music business. So, so thank you again for the wonderful facility and all you guys are doing. And congratulations. Well, thank you. On Groove You and what you've started and that uh, you took that little word you know, is changing and yeah. said, no, it's called changed. <laughs> and from that, you yeah. really created this brand. Yeah. Right? Yep. That's correct. Yes. 